So uh, welcome here everyone to our fourth virtual open day to the farm of Bill and Jack Madigan. We're down in Wine Gap in County Kilkenny. I suppose uh, the Madigans have, have gone into, into dairy in the last 12 months and Jack, uh, the, the next generation, has taken it on in, 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 in association with his dad, Bill. The sequence of events today is we're going to have a few minutes with the Madigan family about why they got into dairy, uh, what was the motivation to do it. Jack is going to talk about maybe grazing, the farm management support, and the transition from uh, veal and Miss Cantor's uh, production into, into dairy. Marco Farrell, our project coordinator, will talk about uh, uh, the design, farmyard design, the buildings and the costs. Our farm management support lady, Jordan Malloy, will talk about grazing, paddocks, uh, fencing, roadways, and how cows make their way to and from the robot. But if I was to go over to, to Bill, yeah. Bill, uh, there's been big changes here in the last 12 to 24 months. Yeah, the big changes. The, the dairy, of course, is the big change. Um, when Jack came home, he went into veal. We started doing a bit of Kilkenny Rose veal. Um, thankfully, like that, we went into dairy in the last two years because the restaurants have been all closed with COVID-19 and it's difficult to sell veal the last two years. So I think we're not sorry about that. Um, but the dairy is going well. Um, maybe we do things a little bit different, I suppose, here on this farm. We have fleck fees and, you know, you mentioned miscantus and things. Um, and possibly we'd still grow miscantus only. These things evolve. The, the contracts change for miscantus. Uh, Eden Dairy stop buying miscantus and so on. We're still supplying a nursery in Cork with, with miscantus. But um, it changes. And should we move with the times, you know? In truth, there's not a whole lot of option. Um, like the miscantus was going well for us and it suited us well Jack was doing the veal and we were, uh, the, a lot of the land all the land effectively was under contract with Eden Dairy for miscantus and then that changed but we were wondering okay we could con continue with the veal the what were you to do with the land okay when you take away the miscantus then you say what are the options okay sucklers really you know nobody's getting into sucklers it's not a runner sheep not really a runner we had sheep and I know sheep and have used sheep but um, it's you know that wasn't really a runner either and tillage wasn't a runner you could plow and we've often plowed and so on we've had potatoes and grain and everything on the farm but like so it wasn't a runner so when you go the full circle unless you go for something very exotic you're back to dairy and the dairy is rock solid it's steady you know you know where you go the milk truck comes every day or every second day or whatever and collects the milk it's it's kind of easy you know if you could get into dairy and get a nice dairy um, and particularly like when you moved with the times and put in a modern robotic system it's good like particularly i think for a beginner the amount of feedback and information you get um, is amazing people think it's about milk and cows that's the easy part hunt them in in the morning and milk them and in the evening okay it's a bit routine but that's the easy part for a beginner it's like like i, I had no idea what ketosis was you know until the robot uh, told us you have a cow that's ketotic and then Jack calls the vet in and so on and suddenly then you link up with Brett's and get the nuts altered you know and they kind of a live feed to see what milk is going day by day and and adjust the nuts to solve the problem you know and the vet said to me most cases we don't see that what happens is your farmer rings up and he has 20 cows that don't go in calf and that's the first time we know that he had a problem with ketosis it's just I'm surprised at the whole thing the technology I think it's a good system and I, I, think, I think it suits Jack, it suits young lads anyway, all the, all the technology end of it. But. So I suppose Jack, um, yeah. you had an existing shed in place yeah. and you have a grazing platform out there. Yeah, yeah. So um, how have you found the transition and uh, how have you found uh, getting into milk? Uh, really good, um, Alan. The reason we felt the robot was a good option was it's um, like having a relief milker on the farm 24 hours a day, an experienced one that's able to tell you the protein, the fat, the cell count, everything else to do with the milk. Um, but uh, not having had a huge amount of experience with milking cows and dairy, we thought that that would be um, a huge asset um, and valuable with the startup process. And it I suppose it has exceeded our expectations in that area. Uh, yeah. yeah, I see as well that you went for the more uh, beefy look, uh, kind of a cemental stroke, fleck feet type yeah, cow. Yeah, yeah. And was that more because of your dad coming from the beef background or did you just want to do something different like veal and miscantus and 
all the other enterprises you've been in? Yeah. Um, there was, I suppose, a few reasons for it. We had a fresh start. Um, we didn't have anything to work, to work off. We hadn't existing dairy stock. And so we went around trying to see what was the best animal to start the template for our dairy. And um, with the, we came across Fleckfee and felt that having come from the beef side of things and pr producing the veal, the calf uh, was more complete, dual purpose than the traditional dairy breeds. So we thought the safest way to work this, instead of going 100% fleck fee or 100% Frisian, was we do half and half. Mm -hmm. So we bought 35 purebred fleck fees. Um, they came from Austria through um, Mick Butler and fleck fee IRL and Kilkenny. And we got then 35 good quality uh, Frisian type animals. And the thinking was, whichever of them was working better for us, we could focus and breed a little bit more that way and then over time we move the herd in that direction. Everybody had their own view and we spoke to different farmers uh, what's the right cow to get, you know? Um, some were, you know, Holstein, mm -hmm. some were Jersey Cross Kiwi, some were Frisian, you know, and everybody has their own idea and some were Fleckfee, you know? Um, and it, you can see why, you know, because a good cow is a good cow no matter what breed they are. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's the difference. Yeah, but yeah. W one of the things that pushed us towards the fleck is that the amount of phone calls you'd get yeah. in the veal from fellas saying, would you take 100 calves out of five or each? And that was kind of frightening for us because we thought, this thing is, these calves are becoming a problem when fellas are ringing. One fella rang one day looking to know he'd take 500 jersey crosses out of five for each. Yeah. 500 yeah. calves for veal. No way. <laughs> but, um, but it did show us then that this was becoming a bit of a worry. So there was definitely incentive then to look seriously at the fleck fee. The, only, the drawback with the fleck fees compared to a Frisian animal is that they vary a little bit. The good ones are super and the bad ones are not much good. The Frisians are more even and slightly more consistent, yeah. but if you could develop a herd of the better type Fleckfee animal, mm. you would have you would have great stock. Yeah. And the calves are worth so much; it's a huge boost to the dairy. The fact you have the calf there, it's an added bonus. And you know, at the shoulders of the year, like suddenly cows are calving now, not much of a milk check, few calves slipping away there, gives the whole thing a lift. As well, the robot is restricted on numbers. It's not like you can milk you can add a few more cows. Um, so the calf is another source of income that'll help balance up the whole thing. So I kind of feel with the robot and the fleck fees, you get so much milk, you also get calves. It's an added support to the whole farm. That's good. I suppose, Jack, one of the common themes that runs through my mind every time I think of you, and I ask you from your transition onto robots, is that despite how much I manage your expectations saying, right, this is going to be difficult, it's going to be all hands on deck. You guys need to be around the yard. You need to be tuned in because it's a big change. Uh, because the robot will make your cows. The success of the system is down to the operator. Yeah. Everyone had it hyped up to be, it was going to be hell's bells. We would get no sleep for two months. There was going to be all kinds of problems. Fail cows, the phone was, everyone in the country told me the phone was going to ring me every night three or four times. Um, you know, it, it was all problems. Um, I suppose we were ready for these problems, but they didn't happen. Um, I think it was um, the mentality uh, was important you'd have dealing with the robot was just to kind of stay cool. The robot though played ball f from start to finish, like the, it, it didn't break down, there was no problems. Any issues that arose were from human error or just a bad information put into the robot. You didn't tell the robot the right information about the cow and it you know, it, 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 there was some kerfuffle or whatever. Um, I couldn't really fault the machine. Um, a year on, looking back on it, this spring they're calving away at the moment and it's, it's a pleasure. It, the cow calves, put the cow in, she has been milked already, it'll cup her and away you go and it's, it's really, really good. Um, but I have to say last, the, the, the starting off wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. It was actually, it was well doable. Um, and I, I, I was really pleased overall. Yeah, I, I think guys, to be fair, we'd have to attribute a lot of that success to you lads, because you're open-minded, you've been in other ventures, and you know that the success of any system is down to operators. I, I think we probably had a little bit of luck in that yeah. the, uh, 
Calvin pattern wasn't too tight. True, yeah. We bought yeah. the heifers uh, from different sources and we got the ones we got from Austria were earlier and then we got some later calves from herds. You know, when you go out to buy heifers, people, everyone wants to keep their, their January calves. But uh, it ended up that we had quite a long calving pattern yeah. at the start. First one calved the yeah. 13th of December yeah. and the last yeah. one calved late, I don't know, uh, yeah, the yeah. first of April yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So like our six weeks was way out the window. But that meant that they were coming slowly and yeah. each one had time. Yes, and there was also the two of us. Yeah. You, you couldn't yeah. but say that's a big help. Do you know what I mean? If there is a bit of an issue, yeah. there's two people there. And with calving as well, we probably didn't have as much fatigue as yeah. a person on their own would have because we could take turns looking at night on cameras and stuff like that, which is a big help. But uh, you, you, you really need to. Yeah. 70 heifers at the start, little things, because you know, kind of when yeah. you're putting yeah. in a new uh, sure. you want one at each side. And you, know, yeah, yeah. you might have to hold the cow's tail yeah, or yeah, yeah. something. Do you know what I mean? Um, if you were on your own, it'd be hard now, Yeah, you know? it would. So I suppose with 70 odd cows on the system in your yeah. first year, yeah. and like with a, 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 a transitioning done inside the existing facilities that are here, what's your plans for the next two or three years in terms of cow numbers yeah. and production going forward? Yeah. Now they have one year behind your belt. Yeah, well, the, f the first year was good. Um, we were lucky with COVID and everything, the milk and the milk price and everything was good. Um, the plan going forward is definitely to put in a second robot soon. Um, if not spring 12 months, spring 24 months uh, for sure um, and double up again get another 17. We calved um, some autumn calvers this year that was a good um, I think it was a good idea it worked well kept the milk going through the winter and boosted the numbers uh, the milk went was down and that's something we'd like to do as well um, to increase the autumn calvers. Um, you get about 85 cows I'd say on to one robot. In an all year round. Yeah, so in an all around, staggering him a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, makes a difference too. Oh, it does. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it, def yeah. it definitely makes it. Oh, it's yeah. a big help. Um, probably long term, then we'd have to look. Uh, we'd like to expand it further. There's potential, I suppose, in the farm to go um, bigger, but uh, that'd take more. I suppose we'd like to. The fact the robot's modular and it's kind of done in twos, yeah. to put in a second one is very simple. We could even accommodate it here in the shed, a bit more housing and it wouldn't cost the world. If we were going to go bigger then, to take a bit more structure and investment and you might take up kind of a larger jump, I don't know, maybe if you went for four robots then or something like that. But the, the plan is to grow it and expand it and I don't really see right now why we won't or uh, continue to grow it. So there's great ambition for uh, growth there. Is, there. for sure, definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's good. Um, like the dairy probably surpassed our expectations on um, overall on how, how, how well it has worked out really. Jack, yourself, had yeah. you any experience of dairying uh, before you actually went into production yourself? Had yeah. you worked on any farms or had you been out and about? Yeah, yeah. I suppose my first experience of dairying was actually with Lely. When I was in college um, and we had started the Kilkenny Rose Veal and we were doing the veal and we were looking for an automatic calf feeder. And at the time um, we came across the Lely calf feeder and I was looking for a college work placement for a couple of months um, and I thought geez Lely um, would be a kind of a nice company if I could get it, get some work with them and see learn about the whole thing so I got a about a three or four months of a work experience with Lely and at the time there was several robots going in in Carrick on shore and I got to go around on the farms there so that was my time with dairy and I had seen how robots worked and different things and I found it really interesting. So at the end of the work placement um, we bought a Lely calf cam feeder and used it in the veal production for several years. So then when the time came and the Miscanthus had run its course and we were looking at the dairy, um, you know, I suppose we were naturally drawn to the robotic route a little bit having seen the success of the calf eater and how great a machine that was for us um, and then thinking back to my college experience so uh, that was why we kind of we made the phone call to Lely and to come and look and see about could this robotic milk and work for us. See we, we also looked I suppose when we were starting thinking about the dairy and was there was two options and one was to go with the most advanced modern system which was robotic milking or to go for a second hand parlour and get in for the cheapest um, possible way 
But I suppose we felt with the old parlour, you'd only get a couple of years out of it and you'd have to upgrade. And there would be a quite a considerable cost in infrastructure and building to put in that parlour. And then if that was all going to be undone, it wasn't really much of a, of a kind of an idea long term towards the new robotic machine that would be up to date and modern um, was expensive to buy, but the building work around it was cheap. So I thought it seemed like a good idea and it would work for the farm here on a modular basis and grow it from that. So uh, my name is Jordan Malloy and I work as farm management support for Lely Centre Mullingar and I'm here with Jack and we're going to just talk a bit about maybe start up and the cows and how your first yeah. year went. So um, I suppose when did you start up Jack? Uh, the first cow calved around the 13th of December and 20 hour, uh, 2019 yeah and um, Took a, it was a kind of a wet spring, it took us a while to get out, we, we hadn't much in the way of roadways and ca caused a few problems for us in the spring but after the weather took a little bit of a lift then in March and we started to get them out then. Yeah, really the biggest well. problem was you didn't really have, well you only had a bit of a, a, the A block roadway out that way or that something. That was it, wasn't? yeah. And you had no, nothing for B and C. No, we had nothing so. for B and C. Um, I suppose we ran a little bit late in the winter time with the building work and we didn't get to do much on the way of roads so we only had the A block to work off um, and we needed the weather of course to do road building. We had no real problems with feed, we, a little bit with the Fleckvies at the start losing condition. They came in, they were very heavy. Um, we, were prob we weren't really right on the nuts at the start, but with the robot uh, flagging them for, we had a bit of problems with the protein and the fat ratio was gone a little bit wrong. And Brett's then came in and tweaked the, tweaked the nuts and stuff and we got going then away and then we got out to grass and it worked out quite well. An another problem with the Fleckvies starting off, ours were all imported from Austria direct so they came here in October and then they um, the issue was some of them actually hadn't ever grazed grass about yeah. half them had but half hadn't and they also weren't used to electric wires and it caused a little bit of problems at the start because when we went to go to grass they were getting shocks they weren't used to the wires and they um, weren't even used to grazing grass so so there was a good bit of training and to be honest that's what caused more of an issue in spring for us than the robot. It was actually getting cows used to going out and grazing grass. Uh, we, but it worked out in the end. They got in on it after a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and as for actual, when you were training them onto the, when you were putting them onto the robot for the first milking or yeah. first couple of milkings, um, how did you find that? I found it. Uh, Fairly good. Um, we don't have a bucket plant, um, so all 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 cows that calve are milked on the robot for the first milking. Um, so that can be a little bit tricky, but it, even if they don't milk great the first time or that, you can let them around, give them a while, and let them in again and milk them. Um, it uh, overall, the Fleckvies were very docile, very quiet. A little bit more easy going. Frisians are quiet too, mm. but the but the Fleckvies were especially quiet, um, which was a help. They were calm in the robot, um, so th they they got used to it quite quickly. Only little issue with the Fleckvies was some of their teeth were fine and quite, narrow, quite narrow, and just when the robot had come on, sometimes and others hard. The, it can draw air and the cups could, wasn't, sealing properly, wasn't yeah. sealing properly and could come off and have a little bit of issues. Really only a problem for the first couple of days until they just soften and everything um, gets going. Um, I suppose the Fleckvies milk very fast then once we got into the, yeah. the, uh, the grazing season and that and they were really milking well, um, they milk very fast the Fleckvies, uh, which is a good thing on the robot because time yeah. is you that know, important. Was actually, I think the Fleckvies were 2.5 kilos of milk per minute. Whereas your kind of typical average heifer herd now would be about 1.9 yeah. kilos per, of milk per minute, and your average uh, cow herd would be about maybe 2.2 kilos per minute. So they were actually substantially faster, yeah. even as heifers. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see now what even what they go to this year on milk speed wise. It will for sure, um, and uh, that was that was a big help. They're also um, it seemed to be quick once they got in on the hang of the grazeway, they were quick to move at the. At, gate change times they were always away to new grass fast um, the flex which 
I don't know, is it they just they got the hang of it or whatever later in the summer, but they were good to move and um, and they, they, they milked well overall. So the fleck fees varied a little bit. Some of the lesser fleck fees didn't milk as well as the Frisians, but there was a few fleck fees that really performed super. Um, we had one of the better fleck fees there. Um, at peak was milking 39 litres a day as a heifer. Um, you know, she was really doing well and a model cow went back in calf, never had to treat her for anything, you know, she was just worked away and did as she should. Um, so, uh, no, they, they worked out well overall. The, the two of them actually probably complemented each other a little because the Frisians have better solids uh, yeah, percentage, your, your percentages were better, um, yeah. but less liters. So I suppose when it comes to the bulk tank, it's all mixed together, and yeah. sure, it's, it, it worked out quite well, you know. Yeah, because I think we, sure we had a we did have a report there at the start of yeah. January, and I think roughly they ended up doing similar solids, yeah. like yeah. give or take four hundred kilos of milk solids. Yeah. I think yeah. is what they that ended up it, doing. Yeah. But your fleck fees would have done more yield, yes, less percentages, and then your Frisians would have done. Exactly. Less yield, but better percentages. Yeah. So they end up being about 400 kilos and roughly the same meal as well. About the same meal, not much. That's a, the beauty of the robot is you have the feed to yield. So you're really only feeding cows that are yeah. performing and they need the feed. Yeah. And then you're not carrying, feeding extra nuts to these lesser cows. So um, that was uh, like, that's a huge advantage, really. Um, the only other difference, I suppose, in the fleck is they're huge. <laughs> There's no cow, point yeah, saying are, anything yeah, else, yeah. only the fleck fees are massive and um, like you know you see the cow here like <laughs> she's colossal size, yeah. a, a really good cow, milk's great, calf easy, um, I don't know about fitting in everyone's cubicles, if you had heavy ground not 100% sure but for milk speed, milk yield, the calf, the calf um, they're docile uh, like they are a good cow, they're a great all rounder, and I suppose with the robot, they're, they're they suit the robot well. Um, uh, they're a, maybe a little bit of a bully, um, they throw their weight around a little bit, but yeah. uh, no, I have to say, I, I do like the fleck fees. And then this year or last year, then you would have used a fleck fee bull on everything, yes. So anything that's calving now, Frisian or fleck. Is, is a fleck fee calf. He's a fleck fee calf, yeah. yeah. They'll be either purebred fleck fees or uh, cross. And um, that's the thing. And they're coming in a nice colour too, yeah. the calves, and they're nice size, kind of look a little bit like a Hereford, I suppose, or yeah, a cemental we'll shirt. There, yeah. In the back one, yeah uh, and, um, and, and they'll be a nice size then that they won't be as big as. Exactly. Your, your actual typical fleck would yeah. be kind of a halfway in between, hopefully. And, and um, when we were in Austria picking the fleck fees and looking at them, they all out there were telling us that the, f the first cross was a particularly good animal um, to milk. You know, they, the cows, she's not too big, she's nice, and um, I suppose milk yield, milk solid wise, you're probably getting the best of both worlds. And uh, they, should, they should be good, good stock uh, to build, kind of help push on the numbers in the herd. Um, so this year, you're going to have about what was it 75 76 yeah about that um in total road. we'll say in the spring uh, some of them are autumn calvers so they'll dry off during the summer and then calve down again uh later in the year um might introduce depending on how we get on the springtime we might introduce a few more autumn calvers and see uh, we didn't put in any heifers this spring because we had the autumn calvers and we didn't want to saturate the robot later in, in, in the early summer um, so depending on how we're going milk yield wise and free time on the robot last year we were a little bit tight on free time it was very busy at peak we were oh god i think we were under 10 percent free time there for a while it was, it was, it was and that was jammed like the, there was, seven, there was, there was uh, 70 on at yeah, that time on, so yeah. like we're probably we're there thereabouts we might do the same though and maybe not put in spring calvers and put in autumn calvers to just to split it a little bit more to give it uh, a bit more free time on the robot but um no overall that's uh, it's worked out well for us and what should happen this year as well is your second calvers anyway both frisians and fleck their milk speed will improve yes and plus then they won't be you know no and connection times and that are quicker yeah. too it's quicker your, your to cut box, the cows the box time itself will yeah. take quicker to milk a cow even though she's given more milk this year yeah so it should free up a bit more time as well so. yeah that's yeah. it um so uh no no it, it, it's looking good it's been a pleasure this year so far now there's only there's what's calved i think there's 11 calves there now we'll say that are gone in on top of the autumn ones so there's around the maybe just shy of 30 altogether at the moment on the robot um but like out of the 11 it's just 
uh, clip the tail, singe them, put them in, and they'll uh, it, they just it cups never them and away never see them again. Like I haven't had to collect a single cow yet. They're all milked every morning. Um, there's actually there's one that's a, a Frisian one and she's just a little bit hard and she's a little bit uneasy on it and she's just she failed a couple of times but but they're they are milking through they're they're, they're going really really well now yeah. this it's super yeah and you've already sure last year I know you were laid out to grass because of the roadways and all that yeah your roadways done this year yeah and you've already been out a couple of nights yeah we have yeah. we were out there just before the wet weather in the last few weeks we were out um uh, about 10 days ago for four nights and we were going out at 2 a.m. and back in at 10 a.m. and it was working well the, the cows seemed happy ground was okay just about you know okay yeah. it was okay to travel there's loads of grass we have the world of grass um, and uh, hopefully if we got a little bit of lift on the weather again we're kind of ready to go and get them out get again them out get them out for a few hours, hours yeah. get a bit of a pick yeah 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 no, that's fair enough um, yeah, so obviously you're using miscanthus as yeah. bedding um, and they're obviously bedded on that the whole time. So how are you finding that? Is there any problems with it? No, um, I suppose we, we, were, we have the miscanthus and we're still growing. We still have about 60 acres of miscanthus, so we have a lot of it. Um, some of it we're selling um, for heating, but uh, we're bedding the cows with, with it. And that's, I suppose the advantage, a couple of advantages in the bedding is um, they can lie anywhere. They're, they're not competing for a cubicle, especially if you didn't have enough or anything like that. They can calve anywhere. There's no calf going in a scrape or anything like that. Um, cleanliness wise, last year it was easier keeping clean. They were, I suppose the diet they were on, they weren't cows and they were heifers. This year they're a lot looser, but they're still okay. We don't have really an issue with mastitis. The odd one you get a bit, but it's not so much the bedding, it's the cow. They're, it's like any herd, you have one prone to just lying somewhere where she shouldn't lie. She take an ocean and lie at the water tank or somewhere yeah. dirty or, you know, out on the slats or do, do something silly. But um, it's not, no, it's working out well for us. I don't really see it as a problem. We did, um, we actually did tests on any cases. We got a mastitis, we took mill samples and got them analysed. And even the vets were surprised that the bacteria we got um, any time on along wasn't from the bedding, it was the fly. Um, a couple of cases of mastitis were from the fly. And to be honest, that made sense because during the summer it was nice weather and stuff and there was fly activity and I'd put it down to kind of a first year mistake, not being that experienced. You have them going through the grazeway to get yes. into the shed and vice versa. So at the moment, they, when they're milking, they actually yeah. still have to go through the grazeway. They do. Um, what's unusual, I suppose, about this shed compared to normal sort of type or the modern type dairy shed is the centre passageway for feed. There, there's a centre passageway for feeding. They're not fed on the outside, so the cows are housed either side of the centre centre passageway. And um, the way it works for the milking cows is they're rooted through the grazeway back into the shed. And I found it an advantage, to be honest, compared to having um, your robot with. Uh, access to the to the cubicle house in that you're able to kind of uh, put cows in that you want to put in say when they're going out to grass it's easy uh, all we do is change the gate times they're gone out the other road from say 2 a.m in the morning they don't even notice in the pen you'd see it they just empty out slowly and then 10 a.m in the morning they're diverting back into the shed and um, the robot and the housing is separate so when they're out at grass they're not in in the house uh, and I suppose it was just, it was down to using the shed that we had. Um, we just built the tank room and the rubber room in the corner of the shed, put the little lean-to off the outside. The slatted tank then connected the two sides of the shed and it actually worked well. It was relatively simple. Yeah, and it, it trained the heifers then. It trained like, the heifers. Yeah, that was a handy Huge problem, advantage. Yeah. When we went to grass, all the heifers were trained to the drafting gate. So really, um, the, it was simple from that point of view. And it can be tricky enough, the drafting gate. There's no point saying otherwise. Yeah, it takes a bit of time. It takes a little bit of time to get them used to it. So they were in completely on that. And um, it, it was good. I, I wouldn't really change that uh, about it. Started with seven, or you had 70 heifers on it last year. How many did you have to get rid of, or was there any that you had to get rid of? <laughs> there was. One of the initial five um, uh, Frisian cross uh, that came in um, was not, not suitable for the robot. <laughs> she worked away fine at the start, but the, really all that was wrong with the cow was the cow was too clever. Um, she was able to 
should go into the robot and, and to be honest people get oh will she kick and will she do this and all that that's not really a problem with, with the robot the biggest problem with the robot is a cow that just um, barely moves, barely moves. Yeah. all she has to do is just don't sway, stand yeah. sway sway yeah. that's exactly yeah. it and she used sway and um we tried lots of different things trying to get her to just steady up milking her slow milking the nuts dropping the nuts down slower you know nuts quicker yeah. all kinds of things and yeah. less nuts Stand more nuts yeah. standing <laughs> with her once a day three times yeah. a day everything and she was just one of these cows she was lively and um oh she was tricky and then the last straw was she figured out how to open the push one, gates one, the one-way one one gates way. going the wrong way which is amazing but she did it so she was suddenly able to skip from paddock a to b without going through the robot to get milked and then we said ah oh, that's it but to be honest out of this say 70 how long did she last Jack? oh god <laughs> this went on for probably four or five months okay. so it was a good while yeah. we were persistent um but out of the 70 for one to mm. go i didn't think it bad no. all the other cows worked fine um and we had no real issues um at all there was only one other fleck fee we had to call um she didn't go back in calf and she was in kind of an underperformer yeah, to be honest production was low as well, wasn't bad it? Yeah. yeah she was just a, a kind of a dud one but uh apart from that everything worked out well yeah um i suppose we had very little experience in dairy there's no point saying otherwise i didn't go to new zealand i didn't milk hundreds of cows we didn't have cows here i didn't do relief milking for summers on end um but i suppose we felt um we, we were never afraid of a challenge in anything we did in the farm here we always said you know what i mean the, the way to do something is get stuck into it and and give it a go uh the r reason the lelly wins out hands down is the information it gives you and the support uh from the moment we bought the lelly we went to several training days several farm walks and then we had the jordan and uh, engineers, were out there engineers up, yeah. and everyone calling on a regular basis to help advise us on the whole thing and the beauty of it is that the fact they can dial in remotely you're able to i can phone you and mm. say the cows took a little drop in the milk or what's up there or could we get a bit more there's something not right the rumination is down they're yeah. not doing or this can we have a site is yeah. there something like that phone yeah. in uh Jordan can dial in, look remotely and say, well, what's the story with this or that? And ask me some questions, make an adjustment, see how it goes for a day or two. If it's still not right, call for a visit and have a look. Um, and it's the same with the backup and the ser service and the repair. You can phone them up. Even I remember at City Things, we were training cows. And I remember at the start, you know, when you're not that good in the computer. And I, I, I couldn't get it to... Um, what happened was a cow walked in and I succeeded her milking and I wanted to actually milk her again. I should have failed her, not succeeded her. And I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't sure how to set it to milk her again. Pick up the 24 hour number, phoned him, someone answered. This is, you know, like cow calf late night, two in the morning. The lads answered, told me what to do. And sure, I was going again two minutes later and there was no issue. Like, and said, that's worth anything. When you have enough stuff that could be going wrong, that's out of your control, when you suddenly feel you have a whole load of people there behind you helping you out, um, that's a great help. And then there's the whole side with the robot, which is the key is the grass. You have to get the grass right. It, it doesn't allow you to grow bad grass. You have to grow good grass. You have to graze it out right and you have to fertilize it right and look after it. And sure, again, with yourselves. Um, yeah, we had you, discussion you, group meetings as well. That, well last year we yeah, did have a few small ones. There and, was, yeah. and it was always other first year fresh, you, you know, um, in the same boat heifer here, farmers. Yeah. yeah. And um, the same boat, we go around to one lad's farm and he says, this is working, that's not working. And the same then you call sort of every couple of weeks, walk the grass, go, need to mow that out, spread fertilizer, this, that. And you have your plan, your template, and it gives you focus and you don't have to be, um, you know, worrying about making a mistake. You see the mistakes coming down the tracks for us and we can avoid them so they don't happen. And uh, that's, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really good overall farm package, you know, and that's it, yeah. Hi, my name is Marco Farrell. I'm a project coordinator with Lady Centre Mullingar. I'm in the role now about two years and I would have got involved with this project. It was back in August last year. Yeah. Um, I visited farm with the yard planner, Simon Moore. And I remember that day actually, you already had got this tank 
dug yeah. and you were beginning to stand shutters for walls. So you and Simon already had done some talking about what the plan was going to yeah. be. We had, um, uh, I suppose, when we did the deal and we went ahead and it was all planned, um, we, Simon spoke to us and came down and we gave a bit of a kind of a rough talk around what was to happen, where the robot was to go and there was a tank to go here and that. So yourselves then were going to draw up a detail drawn with pipe work and everything and to get the ball rolling then we started the tank because it was getting late in the year you know we were just to be sure we wouldn't run out of time so we started off with the tank and got that in to connect both sides of the shed and our grazeway was to be put on top of the tank we just thought to be a cleaner way of uh, managing the grazeway and then um, we did up all the drawings inside for the robot room the tank room the office the compressor room and the little return shoot for the cows coming from separation. Yeah, so part of my job then would be um, surveying the existing structures down here and putting together, as Jack was saying, the complete set of builders' drawings to allow the work to be brought to completion. And I suppose two things would stand out in my memory about this build. One is that you were moving at a fairly fast pace. I mean, you wanted the drawings fairly quick <laughs> and you had a, a time frame that you wanted to have the robot installed by. And secondly, you were very hands-on. I mean, a lot of the work you did yourselves. Yeah, we, we did a good bit ourselves. Um, we was getting, I suppose, the year kind of slipped away a little bit on us. And um, we were trying to get going, like, before the winter got in, to get all the groundwork done. And also, we were going to go to Austria to buy the fleck fees. So we were going to be away a for a little bit. And we had the existing farming going on. Um, and we did a good bit of the work. We were keen to get the drawings, I suppose, in as much detail as possible. And they were, they had everything on them um, because we were going to do a good bit of the work ourselves. Because we were putting it into the existing shed, we felt that we could fix, uh, we could do a lot of the kind of piping um, and flat concrete ourselves. Um, and uh, it, it worked out well once we knew what we were doing and that's where the, the detailed drawings came in. Yeah, and uh, when it came to your build, we were taking advantage of the fact you had this fine shed here already. Yeah. So the onus was getting everything we needed under the one roof, making use of the shed, but also keeping it contained in size because we wanted to be compact, but at the same time, yeah leave as much room as we could yeah. for yeah. livestock. Exactly. And size-wise, like, what did we get? I mean, we've got the clean room here for the robot, compressor room, yeah. milk tank is in here, and your office. Yeah. It's not cramped by any stretch of the imagination, but space-wise, it's... It, it's... it's um, the, whole, the shed here, the dimensions on the shed, it's 100 by 100 feet, um, and a 20-foot centre passageway. So all the pens were... 40 by 20 feet, 40 deep and 20 foot span long. So uh, initially we didn't want to um, mess with the shed's kind of geometry too much because the way it's designed, because it's a bedded shed, is we're able to lock cattle to the back of the pens and to the front of the pens. Uh, so we felt if we could fit the robot in uh, the back of two of the pens, so it fits in about 20 by 40, it's actually a little bit longer, it's about 20 by 45 feet, contains the robot, the tank room, the office, the whole lot is in it. And then above the robot is the water tanks and the meal bin then outside coming in through the, with the auger. And it worked out fairly well. I mean, price-wise, obviously you've tried to keep budget yeah. as much and then obviously doing a lot of the work yourselves. That would have also have helped keep a handle on cost. Yeah. But without going into any great detail, would you have an idea, ballpark? Um, investment uh, goes outside yeah. of the robot? R roughly, apart from the robot, so for the tank, the bin, and we'll say the, uh, the slatter tank, the milk tank, the bin, and the ro rooms inside the office and the room, about 60-ish kind of thing is probably where it cost. Um, uh, it didn't take a huge amount of concrete, uh, you know, it's quite compact. And uh, then we got to do a good bit of it ourselves, you know, helping them, working with the builder and, you know, and having it yeah. ready for him. Like we dug out the tank, the slat of tank, dug it out ourselves. Yeah. The guy came then, poured the concrete, did the shutters, dropped the slats on, backfilled it ourselves. Yeah. Then we went putting the shed up. We had the teleporter, helped the lads stand the little lean-to here, you know, 
and then inside in the robot room fixed all the pipes helped with the flat concrete again the teleporter you know and we were involved throughout the whole look. even with the electrician helped putting the wiring up you know just tacking the wires up for him to speed him up and <laughs> the whole way along we were kind of involved with it and we did a, a wooden a roof uh, over the robot not the concrete hollow core slabs um, so again because we could do it ourselves and it was a little bit cheaper but it worked out fine you know in the end and doing all of those jobs between the trades or helping out yeah. when the trade was here yeah. I mean that shaved quite a bit of time off because I remember I was here I think the 31st of August was my first day on yeah. farm we were ready to install end of November and yeah. I mean commissioning and startup then happened mid-December everyone we had that was helping um, played ball you know drawings came through on the days they were to come through builders arrived when they were to arrive and uh, the fact we were able to do it, we, we kept the whole thing moving on. We, we knew we had to have it ready. You, you, you know, we didn't want to be under too much pressure. And, and, you know, the main reason we wanted it ready was you were putting in so many robots around Christmas time and after Christmas. We wanted to be before the rush because we knew if we got in before the rush, it, it, there wouldn't be as much pressure um, on everything and everyone. Yeah. So. Um, that was it and, and we pushed and it, it worked out well and we got there and it was we did a little bit of cosmetic stuff at the end to finish um, once the robot was installed ourselves but no it, it, it's fine yeah and that's one of the things I suppose we would be always trying to push for to have people in earlier because as you said I mean cows are calfing now end of January yeah. start of February and there's gonna be a glut of people that want to get going and I mean without that push it's very easy for materials to get delayed, yeah. contractors get delayed. Yeah. So communication, I know we spoke, we were speaking a couple of times a week. Uh, yeah. We would have met the contractor, Twice. would have met the electrician. Uh, when the tank man arrived, we spoke with him yeah. just to keep things moving and yeah. Yeah. eliminate any dead time. Yeah. And I, I suppose we got, um, one of the main kind of things, a bit of research we did at the start was we, we used people in all aspects of it that, um, you had maybe worked with before or had good experience of the whole system for instance like we, we used a crowley bin um and uh, that was um like loads of people use them and they work with the robot and it was dead simple i just rang them up and they came and they did it the milk tank was the same um it was put in there was no issue with you know because i suppose the milk tank is our thing the robot's your thing they have to talk and work together like so um there was no issue with that that worked out perfect and um uh yeah we, it just everyone kind of cooperated and it worked out great yeah? yeah and the nice thing then about this build is the fact i mean for not a massive investment you've got up and running yeah. but this is the long-term placement for this robot. I mean, there's plans out there I've seen where you're hoping to put future robots into the shed, yeah. expanding out beyond yeah. the tank here. Yeah. And it's not like you're gonna to have to spend money taking down or knocking stuff that you've just built. Exactly, the plan, of course, um, I suppose the robot being modular, it's all planned in kind of blocks of say 60 or 70 cows. And when the first one went in, it was, um, plan that uh, to put in a second one definitely and then look forward and hopefully get in a few more after that but uh, it's it's really simple to put in the second one we have the compressor we have the computer we have the bulk tank the bin everything was designed to handle two robots and the location has been left even there's a doorway blocked up with blocks but just poured in the kept in the shuttered wall we'd say yeah. that for the next room to be yeah. beside it um, easier to knock out block than get out of a console that's exactly yeah. it so the whole thing was planned around uh future and the location of the robot as you say for uh building future housing for cows further on that's in the right location that the whole thing doesn't have to be yeah. changed everything is is thinking long term yeah. um but for for I suppose a relative like what we did could be done in a traditional shed okay we had a new a relatively new shed yeah. whatever it is five years old six years old um, you know it, it worked out well but it, it, it was quite straightforward and quite simple if we hadn't had to put in the concrete the slatter tank it would have been dead simple yeah. um, that was probably a big cost you know really but uh, yeah uh, another thing then is power. I mean, you went for a power upgrade here. We did. We changed the transformer. Um, 
it, uh, when we started, the ESV are a little bit slow. Everyone knows it with these things. Yeah. Um, but we started actually on the existing transformer. I think it's a, is a 15 or a 16. 16 or a 16. Had here, yeah. And then we went up. We decided to upgrade um, to a 32. Uh, I think it's the 32. It's the biggest one anyway on the single phase. The cost for three phase here is huge. Yeah, um, yeah probably 29 <coughs> kVA, I'd say you went up there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we went for that anyway, kind of just to safety in the system that between the house and the shed and the robot and everything and putting in the second robot or that that we have enough power there so um we did that and it was a, a, a good it was a good job yeah any, uh, any memory of how long it would have taken dsb from say the cert going in and applying for the power upgrade yeah. before the actual power been brought to the farm it was um it was one of the things we actually spoke about early on. When we set off on this thing, several people mentioned about the power. It was a couple of months. We were lucky that in, it was, um, uh, we didn't have to stand any poles. And what we did um, for speed, and it was, sure it's a better job really anyway, was we dug in a duct. Yeah. So we, again, ourselves, the digger went back, dug in um, the duct from the pole, put in a new meter box at the robot. And um, they were, we were, I think we were relatively lucky, to be honest. It, it happened when it was, we thought it would happen, but it was, you know, yeah. it was up to the limit now. Yeah. Was, at, the, at the end, it takes a good while. It's yeah. slow, it's, it is slow. And really, electricians don't want to come and start a job either no. until walls are in, ceilings. Yeah. So it's almost like, you know, the robot is going in, we'll say, the end of January, yeah. but really, you need to have everything built oh. by mid November. Yeah, yeah at the latest, so he can come in, do his work, send off the cert, and then at least you've got some time as a buffer to act between the electrician coming in and the power being brought to the farm. Definitely, so you know yourself, these things take way longer, generally, than you, than you anticipate. Now, we got lucky and we got there quite quickly, but um, actually you do have delays um, with stuff, and you're dead right, like, you can only do things in a certain order, and you're waiting on, like that, an electrician or someone to do some bit of a connection to get the, to put up the ceiling or whatever, you know, you have to, but um, uh, over, overall, um, ha having the schedule from yourselves, the G told us the day that we'd have the drawing had arrived and the day the materials had arrived, the day the robot had arrived on site and we had to unload it, each step and the day the robot was going to be put in, you, were, you had us booked in and you told us it would happen if it was ready, if we were ready, and it was actually, and it was mentioned too, if we weren't ready, we'd slip back in the group. You know what I mean? Because the next person had to get there one the next day, so yeah. it mightn't, ha it could be delayed a while for us then. Yeah. So, so it's good, it, mo good motivation there. there good motivation, to yeah. Ready. And sure, you have to. But we took into it anyway, and it it, it did. We we, we it, it was ready on time, yeah. and um, it, and it was they were to be honest, they were lightning quick putting in the robot. William came and did it, and Jesus, he was. He was quick, like you know, yeah. it was very fast yeah, and very good, efficient. and kept, kept place clean. Was and good, uh, like good quality. Everything that was done, you know, was put up nice. Trays and everything all looked looks nice. Yeah, I suppose the beauty of working with Lely and Mark as our project coordinator was that we could do some of the work ourselves. Uh, we wouldn't have been able if we hadn't the project coordinator that knew everything about the way it should be done and what you know what we needed to do next and we had the template and the plan and we were able to work off that and in real time i'd ring you sometimes we'd be putting the pipe down and i'd say is it connecting is it connecting the robot to the buckets or the central unit or whatever and you describe that's bringing an airline and a milk line and a this and a that and then we knew and in our own mind because often when you're doing something yourself we had an image of what we wanted to do, yeah. you had the drawing, and just to make sure everything, everyone was on the same sheet and had the same idea. And uh, that was the beauty of having the project coordinator and worked out really well, which was to a huge advantage. Yeah, and I'd say, look, what fed into that a lot was the farmer as well. I mean, there was always great communication. I mean, anytime there was an issue you called, if you had a query you called, there wasn't that. I would visit farm and say, what's this or what's that? Yeah. We almost spoke about stuff. And then like the fact that we have so many jobs that would incorporate so many of the same details. We had photographs to show you, yeah. you know, similar layouts. Yeah. So sometimes where a drawing doesn't make sense, 
here's a photograph, and you're like, oh, now, yeah. that's to say, uh, the picture says a thousand words. No, that, that's, a, that's a big help. And, and also, there's so many people around with the lelies uh, um, that you have done. You know, it's easy jump in a car exactly. of an evening time and there's some other farmer, you know, someone like us and someone could, you, you might ring and say, would you mind if some guy that's close to you came and had a look, you're just yeah. not sure about something. Sure, you come in 10 minutes, have a look and yeah. settle your mind and you know, exactly. everyone's happy. And, not, and, and sometimes not even just for the farmer, also for a new builder who may have done it before, yeah. may not have done it before, yeah. going and seeing things in the flesh versus on paper. It just gives you, allows you to wrap your head around it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. So, with us in Mullingar, we have two project coordinators there now. Um, I think, looking at the last numbers, we're up around 400 robots. So there's a huge reservoir of knowledge, not just between the project coordinators, but the yard planners at the start. So getting the plan right, avoiding things that we know yeah. have been tried in the past and may not have worked as well as we wanted to. And then, you know, during construction, I mean, as much as you'd like it to go perfectly, there's always going to be a hiccup somewhere, and we have solutions to those issues. And sure, every job is different. You know, every farm, they're all a little bit unique. Um, you, you know, the shed's different, the plan is different, the cows are different. And um, it is a help when you know you're with um, people that have done all the aspects in all kinds of situations before yeah. and that you trust them yeah. if you don't trust them you know jesus it'll go wrong yeah. but um because you'd have confidence in the whole project and the information you're being told you know well if they've put in that many robots they ought to know by now what works and what doesn't work exactly. and you don't have to be the guinea pig yeah. for someone because yeah, exactly. no one wants to be the guinea yeah, pig exactly yeah. no it's our it's what's what we're what we're what we're drawing up and working towards our tried and trusted methods yeah. so i want to thank the madigan family bill and jack for for allowing us onto the farm and for contributing so much information about their transition and i also want to thank uh, jordan malloy farm management support i want to thank mark o'farrell uh, project coordinator for his contribution and uh, I want to thank you all, the viewers as well, for engaging. We have lots of viewers in tonight, so we're delighted with that. And finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions regarding robotic milking, please feel free to contact the Lilly Centre in Mullingar. Thank you. Oh, good, good evening, viewers. Um, I want to welcome our, our panellists, and especially the Madigan family from Wine Gap in, 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 in County Kilkenny. Good evening, Bill and Jack. Hi, Alan. How are you? And I uh, want to say hello to Mark O'Farrell, our project coordinator in Mullingar, and George Malloy down in Carlow. Uh, good evening, guys. Good evening, Alan. Good. Right. Good Bill, I, I, I heard earlier on that uh, Jack was glad that he didn't put in the parlour. I must tell you that you must be pretty glad he didn't put in the parlour because we have three or four requests in from here to the ground, nationwide, and even Fair City. Jack might have a new career. They're looking for an agricultural correspondent. So... No. <laughs> Just as well, so yeah, yeah. They left milk in myself, yeah. Exactly. So we've lots of different questions, so we're going to maybe uh, uh, start asking a few. And um, I think the first question is to the Madigan, so you can decide amongst yourselves who's going who's to answer it. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to bring fleck-free heifers in from Austria? Is there much paperwork involved? And um, what is the premium and roughly what kind of costs are there associated? Do you okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose we used um, Mick Butler in Kilkenny, who's a farmer that really um, kind of likes the breed more than anything else. He's not a dealer or an agent. And um, the cost of fleck fee um, in Austria, I suppose, isn't hugely uh, more expensive than heifers here bought at the same stage. Um, but the cost to get there's a cost to get them back, and then there's a cost of sourcing them out there, and that. So typically, I suppose um, a heifer that's bought three months out from calving in Ireland, it'd probably be standing you somewhere around two two or two three. Um, but the, that sounds expensive. But if you take the calf into consideration, that you have a purebred calf, and when the cow calves down, it's well achievable to get six hundred euro for that calf. So they work out in or around the same price, we'll say, as a Frisian, once you take the, um, back the, the value of the calf. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of, a, I suppose, where it's about. Okay, very good. Question there for yourself, Jordan. 
Have you ever walked a farm that didn't work? And if you have, what kind of farm did was it? It's it's more generally that um, I suppose the farms that need an underpass. They're obviously the big question is the fragmented farm. So um, if a farmer either can or can't put in an underpass or it's going to be too expensive, that's kind of generally the more so the reason as to why. But if you're already grazing and you're grazing block there, there's no farm that isn't suitable. Isn't like even the hilly farms we have, they're they're fine. There's ones that are walking two plus kilometers, they're fine. So there's not really it's really more so just the fragmented farms that are the question marks and you kind of discuss the, the options then like so. Okay, thanks Jordan for that. Mark, just a question for yourself. What are the biggest mistakes people would make during the building and uh, process? Um, maybe underestimating timeframes, Alan. Um, I mean, by the time you get your plans and then you start sending the plans out to contractors, in many cases, a contractor might have a couple of months work lined up ahead of him. So it's not a case that he can just jump on your job right away and you know, start construction. Um, factoring in uh, maybe shortages of material, weather delays, um, all of these things, uh, you know, they're, it's nothing to do with manpower, it's just circumstances that you got to work around. Um, so I think, you know, you just can't start early enough. The, the, if it's done early, I mean, it takes a bit of the stress off as opposed to working all the way up to the line and then trying to get in for robotic milking right away. Okay. Mark, for those people that may not have a list of recommended tradesmen and builders, have, a, have you guys got a list or, or maybe people that farmers can approach if they don't have options in terms of building? Yeah, look, I think I said it before, I'd always encourage uh, farmers to go out and do their own research. There's bound to be somebody in the, in the area that is trustworthy, get referrals from people that they, they trust. Um, uh, go and look at the work themselves but in the event that you're concerned that maybe a bid is too high um, you know I would always say give us a call we, we're doing work now all over the place there's lots of contractors we've got contractors out in, from Mayo down to like Dublin up to Monaghan so there's, there's lots of scope there for us to help out and making sure you're getting value for your money and getting someone who's competent to do the work very good. So we've two questions in here regarding the Fleckfee breed and it's Paul and Brian Horgan, who's a happy lady customer in Cork. And I'm going to just maybe pull the two questions into one and maybe Jack and Bill can take this together. So uh, it said, Jack, what do you look for in the Fleckfee breed? You mentioned there's a wrong and a right type. And also within that breed, have you problems with feet on the big heavy cows and with lots of walking to do? Um, I suppose firstly on the feet, uh, I think any problems we had were related to uh, with feet this year were to do with roadways. Um, I don't think they have any issue with feet, uh, more so than the Frisians, if your roadways and housing and that is up to scratch. So I wouldn't really have a concern. Apart from them being heavy on ground, if your ground is very wet, they're heavier cow, you know, they're just traveling the ground, they'll be a little bit harder on it. Um, in relation to, what was the first part of the question? Now? You mentioned there's a wrong, a right and a wrong type of flexi. Well, I think yeah. it's just some of them are better than others. Um, it, you know, some of them are exceptionally good. And I think Jack and we're of the opinion that maybe there's more of a spread. We're not long enough in the milk maybe to make comparisons with other breeds fully, but um, like uh, some of them are really good and some of them weren't so good. Um, so I suppose in that case if you could end up picking yeah. all the good ones well that'd be great I, I think when we went to Austria picking them first and mm. we weren't that experienced we were focusing a lot on litres and probably mm. not taking enough heed of the actual percentage on the solids um, and uh, I think if you were going and following the genetics that they're, to make sure they're proven back along through the mother and the grandmother for the yield um, you can pick out good ones because mm. The good fleck fee is is really really good. Um, the, probably the advantage in the lesser fleck fee or the the kind of get out of jail card is that if she is an underperformer and you buy in that cow, uh, that heifer, she calves down. You get the calf. You get a good price for the calf. They are a big cull cow, and you get a good value in the cull cow too. 
Um, so, you know, it's it's not the end of the world, um, you know what I mean, to drop out your worst ones. It's not like you're telling the Jersey cow that's very light and wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't get much for them. Very good. While I have you on there, Jack, just wondering, uh, there's a, an anonymous uh, question. How many acres have you on the grazing block for the 70 cows? Um, there's about, um, I suppose, in, uh, including the hedges and everything on the map, there's 80. And it was one of the things at the start, we actually receded from, out, we took out of the Miscanthus, we took out 100 acres and receded it before we started this. And um, I remember uh, Jordan and Sean and that coming down and I thought we'd need, we'd be short grass. Um, so we kept 80 and we rented out the 20 under their advice and we had miles too much. We, we would have got away on a lot less ground. We had to cut silage. There was some of the paddocks we didn't get to graze until the very, very end of the summer in, in the maybe second last rotation. Um, we, there was probably about oh, 10 to 15 acres we, we nearly never touched um, grazing wise. So um, but now we had, a, it was all new grass. And the other thing with yourselves was we manured, um, you know, we were going like with manure every three weeks, you know, so we grew a lot of grass, but we grew good grass. So we didn't mind. While we're just there, Jack, a, a question in from, from John and Martin. What are your anticipated milk solids for the Fleck fee and what bulls are being selected this year and why? Uh, yeah, the solids, um, based on their numbers, they should, the, the average for the solids was, it was like around 750 kilos or something like that the on, on yeah. the cows themselves, based mm. on their genetics coming in um, with the fleck fees. They did 400 this year, but um, there was a, a cup, there was a, there was one or two bad ones in it that probably dragged it back a little. And also we had a few issues in the start of the year with, as we were saying, with a little bit of ketosis, a little bit with getting them used to grazing and in different problems like that. And I think that probably held them back a little bit um, overall. It's it set them back. Um, so it'll, it'll take a good few years. Most of the fleck fees seem to have a longevity. So we should get a good few, hopefully, lactations out of the cows and see how they go going forward. But... Um, uh, this year, anyway, they were kind of on a par with the Frisians. I, I think we were lucky and we got a good type Frisian cow. Um, they came from mostly two farms and uh, they, they worked out well. I, we were actually really happy with the Frisian uh, animals that we got. Very good. Um, the bull, just the, the mass with the bulls, well, we used two stock bulls last year. This year, we'll probably use the stock bulls again and... Um, maybe some AI, but we bought two good stock bulls um, again from Mikkel Kilkenny and we bulled everything with the stock bulls. So we didn't use AI on year one. Perfect. Uh, George, just a question for yourself, and this is from John. What cow is most suitable for the longer walks in, from your experience? Um, so we have a good few farms that are probably doing somewhere between the 1.8 and like 2.2 kilometer walks. And off the top of my head, those farms, one of them is a crossbred herd. And the other couple are mainly just black and white. So uh, from what our experiences, is, the majority of them are black and white, but um, and a couple of uh, Jersey cross herds. But um, as Ro basically what Jack is saying is, is right. Like once the roadways are anyway decent, um, they should be fit to travel and there shouldn't be an is actual issue with them walking two kilometers because again, it's a robotic system. So no one's actually hunting them in with a quad or anything like that either. So they can walk at their own pace. So it's really more so the quality of the lanes more so than the actual type of cow. So, very good, Jordan. Just a question in from County Mayo. Don't think it's come. Yeah, I have 120 acres of good land in the west. How many cows could I milk? And it's from a man called Val. That's definitely not us. But uh, and then, so, how many cows could the old man milk in County Mayo with 120 acres? Well, sure, look, without going into details, like you're going to say a cow to the acres for 120, but sure, it'll depend on how much receding's done, line, P, K, all that sort of thing. So, look, there's too many variables to say exactly, but I mean, a ballpark would be a cow to the acre. Like. Perfect. We have a question here about service contracts and what, do the, what are the running costs of a robot on an annual basis. So, look, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Typically, it, it roughly around 2,200 euros plus fat per robot, which typically equates to about 185 euros a, a month. Um, I know I've heard 
cost as up as high as five and ten thousand euros which is obviously rubbish but that's what it typically costs and then, then in terms of the tea dip and the chemicals and the consumables you're probably going to have the same cost as you would have in a modern spec parlor so you're probably looking at 1500 euros to 2000 there and then you have to maybe allow maybe 500 or 1000 euros for the random for the random call out so we're probably looking there about 4000 to 4500 euros per robot i suppose jack i'll hand it over to you you have a year under your belt what typical costs have you seen in your first year robotic milking um sure it's the same we're in the contract um so that's covering software updates and everything else and the routine servicing and that chemical wise um for the we've used lelly's own chemicals lelly's heat dip um and it's worked fine for us so far like with tbcs and everything are good so there's no issues that way um the costs are as you say we had no um no uh, breakdown of any real significant no actual one bit of a breakdown and parts wise um small uh, you know i think it was little valve was 60 quid or something or that like some, you know a few little, little things nothing big nothing really any note okay just a question there for yourself mark um um sorry it's, um, jordan uh my farm is long and narrow um and my buildings are in the corner it symbolizes like a little stamp on an envelope. Um, how far will cows typically travel and how long will I need to train my cows to perform that routine? Um, so I would say, I'll stop my head about, um, I'd say about maybe 60 or 70% of our farms are laid out in that fashion, as in the farmyard is in the corner, long, narrow, kind of rectangle farm, shaped farm, generally a uh, roadway down the middle that's already there. Um, that's kind of the typical farm. So like most of our farms aren't actually in the middle. Uh, the farmyards are not actually in the middle of the block. So that's not generally an issue. If, without going into too much detail and confusing people, but basically like you have three blocks, A, B, C, one block is the furthest block away, call it A, then you work back, B is the middle block and C is the closest. So really the cow is only going to be walking to the furthest block once a day, once in that 24 hours. Then she'll be walking to the middle block and then the closest block. So like even if the furthest block was two and a half kilometers away, she's only going to do that once and then it'll be relatively close. So as for training, if you're starting off in the springtime, obviously the cows are calving down onto it. Um, I don't know, maybe Jack and Bill would say how long they thought it took to train them to the grazeway, but I would say kind of two, three, four weeks really kind of they're settled on it and like there's still room for improvement but they're settled on it after um i would say three four weeks like i don't know that thanks jordan mark just a question for yourself um how many times typically would the project coordinator visit the site during the uh, uh the building process ah uh, look it varies per build per farmer um it Look, I, I couldn't see it been done in any less than seven visits. I mean, your, your initial surveying to do, the handover. But then, look, if there's a tank on board, you're surveying that after the slats are on, when the steel columns are stood. And then to be a wall layout, you'd go out and you'd look at the pipe before they go down. Um, so, yeah, look, uh, I would say anywhere. I'd say seven would be like, to be honest, it could be up, up, above 10. And again, more, it all depends. Some fellas can, you know, it can be directed over the phone via email. Other people need to just get out there in person and go through things with them. So, um, uh, you know, there's a huge variety there. And Mark, uh, with the, the current climate that's there at the moment uh, with the pandemic, um, are, are you guys are getting out and about. Obviously, I know it's, it's essential services, but are you getting out and about? Or are you doing a lot of this work remote? Or are you, you actually visiting farm? No, we would still be visiting farm. Um, like we are class essential workers who are dealing with animal care, food production. So um, from that end, the commitment to get on farm and to get jobs completed uh, in the time frame that we would have set is still, you know, still our goal. Nothing would have changed in that regard. Okay. Jack, a question for yourself, for yourself and Bill, uh, who wants to decide. If you were to build an extension or a second shed, would you switch to cubicles 
or continue as is? Yeah, well, we, we've often discussed that. Um, we're not really sure. I suppose um, in reality, if we do go on with the second one, or hopefully when we go on with the second one, the plan would be to go for straw bedded um, for the time being. But we definitely build the proportions to fit cubicles. And we'd probably go with the centre passageway again and uh, double cubicles at either side. Um, at least put the space for double cubicles. But um, we have the miscantus and we have bedding at the moment. So the whole secret seems to be with the bedding is to have a big enough area. Um, you kind of need maybe eight or nine or ten, if you could, cubic metres per animal. Um, if the, if you don't have enough bedding room, you can't keep them clean. So it's that's nearly more important than the straw. So uh, that's I think that's what will happen in reality. I think it's going to be straw bedded for now from now on, for the time Very being. Very good. There's a question uh, here about is there a cost in, in developing a farm plan? Uh, I suppose I'll answer that question. Um, no, a lot of people are probably uh, not sure whether they have the suitability. Uh, for robots. So I suppose what we do is uh, we would set up a site visit and do a free farm appraisal uh, to see the suitability. Obviously the suitability of the land, the suitability of the farmer and how the two would maybe work together and also the suitability from a company point of view and actually working in a close relationship. Uh, I suppose when we get into a bit of detail we start maybe needing to, to develop a plan and put something on paper that's maybe where we maybe start discussing mm -hmm. some costs. But for the first couple of visits, there, there are no costs or charges, uh, and, and that's not a problem. So if anyone is looking for um, a free site appraisal, please contact the Lily Centre here in Mullingar. Um, let me see, any more questions we have here? Um, maybe, Mark, this is for you. What's the smallest build I can get away with a robot unit? I'm thinking of putting a unit on a milk farm. Um, would probably look at calving the cows at home and just milking on that platform. Uh, what would be typically, and it's going to be to say it's dry land. So uh, what's the smallest bill one can get away with, Mark? Well, I mean, the robot dimensions, I mean, you're looking at a room that's going to be about two and a half meters to three meters in depth, maybe five meters in length. Um, if you're planning then and having an office there and a compressor room, something for a mid tank, uh, I think you're going to be very close there to what Jack and Bill actually built, which I think maybe was. It's 20 by yeah, yeah, 20 feet. by 45 feet is what the whole thing fits. Yeah. And then yeah. whatever collecting area you have in front after that, then. Exactly. Like if you're going to start a tank in front of it. Um, even if it is on an out farm and you want to keep the bill to a minimum, do you want to use separation um, to send a cow when she's in heat or, uh, or, or sick? So, um, but just purely for the robot, if you'd be looking at a, a room dimensions about three meters by five meters. Jordan, I think you have something uh, uh, similar at home where you've been making uh, robot on, on, on the grazing platform uh, yourself and Brian um, you might tell us a little bit more about what you guys have it, uh, at home uh, yeah now I wouldn't know the dimensions exactly off the top of my head but it's a tree bay shed and um, with a slat of tank two robots sitting in on it clean room is about it's a very narrow clean room so it's only about maybe two meters in depth tank room behind it bit of a compressor room bit of a office that's very small as well. That all fits on underneath, was it under 200 metres squared? I think was what it was. And then the graze, three, was it? 300 metres squared. And then the graze was just sitting off the edge of the tank. So it's literally just three bays. So there's 21 locking barriers to feed X amount of cows. And then that's our, that's also our separation room because the shed is so small and there's locking barriers in the shed on the slat tank. That is the separation room as well. So that's kind of, so it's purely 45 by 45 is what I was just told what it was. So there you yeah. go. So it's purely just a, a, a milking facility in the middle yeah. of the grazing platform. And I believe there's there's another one of that starting up the basically the exact same shed starting up in Galway. 
in the next couple of months. And I think there's another farm as well starting up with that kind of similar blueprint. So those type of farms are getting a bit more um, popular, we'll call it. There's actually two starting up in Galway, both of them who, who want to remain anonymous, but both of them are going to be very close to each other. So they are. Um, but and we, we, we will yeah. keep you posted in time. But Jordan, while you're on that about the grazing platform and that milking unit, how do you introduce cows onto it and how do you take them off it when you're calving them somewhere else? Um, so all we do, um, because the farmyard is actually away, so the dry cow housing and um, even the drying off facilities are all away from the road back shed. They're about six or 700 metres up the road, up the milk lane, across the public road, and then you're into the farmyard. So all we do is we physically walk them up and they're dried off in the old parlour and they stay up then as in the dry cow housing and then when they, they calve they literally cross the road and you walk them back down and then they go into the robot shed and that's it like basically like, that's and then they just stay there till they're dried off again so that's simple as it is. How many years are you doing that Jordan? Uh, this is our eighth spring so 2014 is when we started up. And roughly cow numbers and maybe... Uh, I was one robot, 70 cows, then two robots built it to 90 cows, then one 10 cows, now settled at 120 for the last, I don't know, I think it's been four years, it's been at 120. So that's kind of roughly what we'll stay at, 120 on the two robots. Perfect. Jack and Bill, you mentioned that the full cost of the robot was roughly around the 60,000 euro mark. Uh, would you be able to break that down just a little bit uh, off the top of your head in terms of the milk tank? The slat of yeah. maybe some of the concrete work, uh, the electrical work, any bit of the plumbing. Um, the kind of quick rundown is the tank, the slat of tank is a uh, hundred foot long, uh, I think it's actually a little bit more, but uh, that was about 18,000. Um, the robot ready milk tank, it's actually a second hand tank, um, and it got a new front on it to control to the robotic part. Um, that was 10, the meal bin, um, four, four, and then the concrete inside wouldn't have been huge. I think it was about four loads, three loads, was it? Something like that. Yeah. And then the, the plumbing, um, you need a couple of tanks upstairs, the plastic, you know, thousand litre tanks and a few water pumps be maybe 2000. Um, then the electrics after that, like the ESB connection is a couple of thousand and the bit of wire and a few thousand. And uh, that's it. It's I suppose a lot of the cost is in the small stuff. Do you know what I mean? Just like you have to get a generator to have it there on standby and a few bits and bobs like that all cost kind of a thousand or two. And um, that's that, it depends maybe how well fixed you are that way. Um, but uh, it's it's quite simple overall. I'd have to say it's not you know it's not major stuff. Um, really. If you're doing it all over again, Bill, what yes. would you do differently? Um, I, I'm not too sure to do a whole lot, really, uh, very different. Um, but uh, oh, I, I, somebody asked, you know, would you go back and uh, would you build a parlour if you're going back again? Are you happy with the idea? I absolutely am. I wouldn't go back and build a parlour. I have absolutely no regrets about that. I think it's the way I'm very pleased about that. Um, uh, it, it's difficult because I haven't had a background in the thing it's hard it's hard for us to make comparisons people that have been milking their whole life in a different system are in better position to judge these things but um i i thought it worked out remarkably well um it's still going remarkably well i hope it will continue to go that <laughs> yeah, way yeah 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 but um you know obviously every day you have challenges but they've been you know all surmountable and none of major you know um, and nothing, nothing desperate has gone wrong, you know, which is always a good thing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm very pleased with it. Um, I think uh, I'm very hopeful that we mm. go ahead and build a second one uh, all going well, you know. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I didn't, I, if you were to change something, it'd be only very minor, you know. Jack, in terms of the installation process and the commissioning and the startup, how many days did it take the team in Mullingar to install? Oh, the installation was fast. Um, uh, once we were ready and say the robot was actually arrived in good time, the robot was probably here, geez, it could have been here two or three weeks before um, the installation actually happened. Um, it, to actually get the robot in position and 
ready to be commissioned. So it was all sitting all plumbed up and in place. Probably only took a couple of days. It was, you know, it, it was a, took a week. And to be honest, he, he wasn't here all day, every day. He was coming between a few different places. And then, um, then the commissioning a day or two was all to get the whole thing kind of calibrated and run through and everything. And that happened just before we had our, our I think our, yeah, we were just about to calve our first cow. We, we knew it was getting close and it was all, they came, you were down about two days, I'd say, before she calved, had it all ready, told us how to turn it on and how to get it going to milk the first cow. And then when she calved, we switched it on and um, away it went. So uh, no, it didn't take long. Mm. Sorry, Jack, now I've just lost my, uh, my, my view in here, so one moment. Just having a bit of a technical problem here at the HQ. Just back in again. Good job with Sean Callan in the background looking after the <laughs> sound audio. Um, I think we'd have the last question, guys, uh, 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 to you, Jack and, uh, and Bill. Um, I suppose just a very simple question. How often do you clean the shed out? Yeah. Um, being honest, what we do is we scrape where the cows stand every day um, because it, the first 10 feet where they stand at the barrier gets dirty. And if you clean that out, that'll save the bedding behind. And typically throughout the year, we were... Um, we have a straw blower so we blow it in every second day but at the moment now they're calving down and it's all there's you know it's kind of at full capacity uh, where I was blowing in straw or miscantus swapping between the two every day um, just to be sure with the mastitis and that that wouldn't um, you know get hold on the milking cows the dry cows aren't it's not as much of an issue but um, I find with the straw blower you use so little it's worth just putting in a fresh bit every day just to clean it up. And it's a simple job to do. If you're putting it in by hand, you probably wouldn't do it every day. But um, little and often is the trick with the bedding. Um, and to be honest, it takes no longer than liming the cubicles if you, if you had a cubicle house. So I don't really, um, don't really mind. Perfect. And uh, last question, Jack, we'll wrap it up at this. Uh, are you planning to do your own AI? I see you have the heat detection collars. And, um... We have. Um, what we actually did this year, which was unusual with the bull, was we ran the bulls with them, but when they um, cycled and showed heat on the computer, we recorded it and marked them down as inseminated. And then if they cycled again, we did the same again. So we used the bull kind of effectively like an AI man. Um, and we had all the dates and then everything um, for us. This year, we will do some AI, um, I think, on the early ones. So we will be using the heat detection and it works well. Um, it's, uh, so that's, that's kind of the plan with that. Yeah, a bit of AI and then follow on with the bulls behind. But once you have the heat, you can see how all the cows are cycling. You can see if the bulls are working. Um, it, it works well. Perfect. And to add to that, I have a question to myself. Uh, 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 can I buy the heat detection system as a standalone? So the answer is yes. And uh, it's, it, it's funny that this person should ask. There is a huge, huge interest in heat detection at the moment. Um, I suppose there's a lot of farmers looking at um, uh, scaling up and, and, and maybe cutting out the labour and, 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 um, and, and getting away from maybe the visual, uh, visual observations, the tail painting or the scratch cards. Not saying that they don't work, but people are looking at automating the process. And there's a, quite a lot of interest in heat detection and health monitoring. And even some of our customers have put in heat detection systems in advance of the robot being delivered and installed. So they're getting to breed their heifers and cows in the first year, even before they go milking with a robot. So there's, look, there's a, there's a lot of interest out there and, um, and uh, a lot of in information there available. So um, look, with that, I want to thank all the viewers. I um, want to thank our contributors, Mark O'Farrell, Project Coordinator, Jordan Malloy for management support. Um, and last but not least, I want to uh, uh, thank Jack and Ben Madigan for being open and honest. Uh, for allowing us into the farm, short notice, and for doing a superb job on uh, uh, giving us an insight into their first year of robotic milking. And I've no doubt about it, we have lots of requests, Bill and Jack. Uh, people would like to see us back there in the flesh for a real open day. Right, Something well, you're time anytime. in the future, <laughs> down the road. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. No problem. So, thank you, everyone. Uh,
Good night and good wish. Well wishes and see you soon. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.